good, good afternoon, afternoon everybody. everybody. Now, now I have, have to say, um, I've called this talk, talk career from, from novice to expert, expert slightly, slightly tongue-in-cheek. Tongue in cheek. Claire, Claire Martin, who I've, I've known for many years, years will um, remember years ago us being told that anybody who um, is willing to travel at least 50 miles with a set of slides or a PowerPoint presentation can be considered an expert. So expertise is a rather um, movable feast, if you like. But, but what, what I've been asked, asked to do today is talk to you about how I got <laughs> through my career as nurse, in nursing. So I began in 1978, so we're 42 years on. Um, and what I'm going to do briefly is go through how I got from there to where I am now. And hopefully that will inspire some of you to see that there are ways of developing your career, using opportunities, as Kim said. And sometimes things take a turn that you weren't really expecting, but that doesn't mean to say it's, it's a, a negative thing. It can be a very positive thing. What's really important to me um, and important to all of us in nursing is professionalism. So what we're here for is what, what it says here. You know, we're here to provide professional, expert, successful, safe, effective, person-centred person care to ensure that the patients who come um, and we look after actually receive the best possible care that they can and th their, the outcomes are the most optimum outcome for that particular individual. And in order to do that, we have to have appropriate um, values. And so one of the things that I want to emphasize through this is, is in ensuring that we always have the right values in looking after our patients. So we need to have um, an ethical background. We need to have respect. We need to have integrity. And above all, we need honesty. That will become more clear as I explain further where I am now. You will be aware as a nurse or a midwife or an aspiring nurse or midwife um, that we are governed by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. And part of the thing that they produce is the Code of Professional Conduct. Now, I'm going to put you on a spot here and ask you how many people have actually read the Code of Conduct. Probably about 30-40% of you. I recommend that you look on the NMC website and actually read it. Because if anybody ever gets into difficulties with the Nursing and Midwifery Council, these are the standards by which you will be judged or your colleagues will be judged. And um, it is helpful to have an understanding of what our regulator actually expects of us in order to ensure that we're actually able to meet those standards on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we go back to myself, and my, me, it's not my favorite subject, so I'm rather on, on the spot here. Um, but this is, um, not me, but, but a similar me, if you like, as a newly qualified state registered nurse in 1981. So at this point, <coughs> I'd finished my three years training, I'd got the badge, I'd got the uniform, and oh my goodness, now what? I've been reflecting in order to come and talk to you today, and I still have a memory of my first shift as a staff nurse in a hospital that I worked in at the time. I was terrified. I was working on night duty that first shift. I was in charge of a 36 bedded ward. I was the only registered nurse on duty on the ward and people assisting me were student nurses and nursing assistants. And I had done all the training, so I thought, well, I, you know, I must know what I'm doing. I must be able to get on with it. And one of the things that I learned after that shift is that I kind of forgot that other people around me also might have known what they were doing. I was so full of the responsibility that I was taking that I forgot to use the team. And that's one of the things that I learned very early on in my career and have always 
um, endeavour to keep to the front of my mind when I've been working in any um, area of practice, that the team is important. Everybody in the team has a value and everybody in the team has a role to play and something to offer. So how, however um, you prefer to work, always remember that your team is really important to you. So the other thing that happened at that time was that um, after you'd finished your training, it was expected that you stayed and worked in the hospital that you'd trained in. We didn't train in university in those days. We didn't go and do a university course. We were actually taught in the school of nursing that was attached to the hospital. And there was an expectation that you took a job. But there wasn't always choices. You, sometimes you had to do what was available. And what was available for me was night duty. So I worked full-time night duty as my first job as a staff nurse. Eight nights on, six nights off. Half the time not knowing whether it was day or night because of the, you know, the challenge of when do you eat, when do you sleep, body biorhythms <coughs> going all out of place. Um, and the other thing that was quite a common occurrence in those days is that you weren't based in one particular ward. So at first, I was quite disappointed about that. I thought, really, you know, I'd have preferred to have been able to be part of one ward team and develop my knowledge and skills with a group of people that I got to know well. But that wasn't the case. And on reflection later, I was very fortunate that this happened, I think, because during that period of time, I was able to develop some experience in a whole range of different areas of practice. And that's one of the things that I think is positive about nursing. There is so many areas that you can work in, so many different skills, so many different things that you can learn. But actually, it's quite helpful, I think, to have a broad um, beginning to a career so that you can actually have um, a range of experience and not just hone in on one thing and remain in that one area of practice for the whole of your career. So I was lucky enough to develop uh, experience in um, general surgery, digestive diseases in particular, urology, gynaecology, high dependency unit. This was surgical emergencies, so we had people on ventilators who had had difficulties with um, um, anaesthetics, orthopaedics and maxillofacial, which was a very interesting area of practice. Working at night duty, um, when people are awake in the middle of the night, and those of you who've worked nights will know this, out comes all sorts of information from the patient that you may not ever hear during the day. Um, and Max Fax patients in particular had a lot to say about their fears um, in the middle of the night. Now, unexpectedly, my career took a little bit of a halt at that point because baby number one came along. Not a planned baby, but there we are, you know, doesn't, these things happen. Um, and so I went on to maternity leave and then went back to work when my son was six weeks old. Again, in those days that was quite common because um, the maternity leave um, process was slightly different than it is today. So I moved to day shifts, mostly evenings and weekends, to be able to balance the childcare arrangements with my husband. Um, and then it was this process of adjusting to a slightly different thinking about work because I'd been quite ambitious as a newly qualified staff nurse um, and then discovered that actually I had to sort of adjust my thinking to manage the work-life balance, to manage my responsibilities as a mother um, and to think about what could I really offer nursing at that time. So adjusting to some part-time working and worrying about does that mean that I'm going to um, lose the opportunities that the nursing um, career pathway can offer. But again, um, working in the surgical pool on day duty this time, um, I was able to gain experience in all these areas of practice, the same sort of things as I'd done for, for night duty. What was con significantly different was that there was a really large number of people 
floating around working at the same time. So at night duty is very protected, there's not a lot of people around, you're often the only person who's the registered nurse in charge, um, and a lot of the decision making is made by you. But then you have to learn to listen to other people in the team. Doctors come along, therapists come along, um, specialists come along, all sorts of students, all sorts of things. So it's, uh, it's a completely different level of experience that you gain. And one of the things I think you have to learn from that um, is how to manage people's ways of working, how to manage egos, how to ensure that people um, are working together to make sure the patient gets what they need. Um, and learning how to manage people who are in a more senior position, if you like, so that you don't make them feel uncomfortable, you don't challenge them in a way that makes them angry, but you actually um, are able to learn from them and, and work together with them. Then, along comes baby number two. So again, another process of learning to balance the work and the, um, and, and, the, and the home life balance. At this point, I hadn't been very well after the birth. I won't go into details. Um, so I didn't go back to work until um, my daughter was eight weeks old. It was even more challenging, um, even more difficulty managing the work-life balance, but not impossible. And I think that's one of the things, again, on reflection, you learn that you can do these things. You can adjust your um, thinking about where you thought your career was going, and you can gain um, good things out of every um, experience that you have. However, I was frustrated because I was still quite ambitious. And I needed to think about how to manage that ambition without bypassing the needs of, of my children. So I decided at, at one point that it was time for my career to take a step forward. My brain was tired, it was needing um, so, some um, exercise, I was needing to do more in order to challenge myself. So I was able to gradually increase my hours to full time. And that's one of the real positives about nursing. There is a whole range of different needs in terms of hours and service provision. Um, and, and people will always find the right slot that will suit them, that enables them to, to manage their work and their home life. At this point, I moved into general medicine and care of the elderly and uh, took a role as a senior staff nurse once I'd um, gone up to the full-time hours barrier. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to do something that would make myself feel more fulfilled at work. Now, in those days, as I said to you before, you didn't go to, to university to do your um, nurse training. It was an on-the-job training more than anything else. So although we had academic work and essays to do, most of the work, the, most of the way we learned was a practical work-based um, placement sort of process. Um, and so for me, I wasn't at the academic level of almost at degree level or at degree level at that point. So that was a whole new learning curve as well. However, again, in nursing, there are so many opportunities to do things. There are so many ways that you can move your way through learning and developing your knowledge and skills. So I did a, a number of things. Some of them were work-based and, and nursing or clinical based. Some of them were um, in order to get me to a place where I was the right um, entry level. So I did a couple of A-levels at this point. So I hadn't done them at school. I did them at this point in my own time in order to be able to um, gain access to a university course to do the district nursing diploma course. At the at this point in time, that course is a degree level course. 
at that point in time, the course I entered in the Brighton area was the first diploma course for district nursing. It had been um, a much shorter course previously. So this was a whole new step for me because I was going to university at the age of 33, spent a year at university. It was such an eye-opener to see how much opportunity there is to learn. The active learning, the group activities, the tutor support, protected study time, learning new skills. One of the things that really threw me at that point, anybody who has worked in the community might understand this, that things that you could do very slickly in the hospital environment suddenly became quite difficult in somebody's home. It was like you had to unlearn the skill and relearn it all over again, giving an injection, doing a dressing, all sorts of things. Learning new knowledge, learning about how um, to deliver safe and effective health care into somebody's home, learning about the fact that in a hospital environment, people are very um, much more likely to be passive and, um, and, and I, concordant, I'm going to use the word, but they, they are in an environment that they're out of their comfort zone and they're likely to want to do what you've, they, they've been asked to do in order to get well, in order to get out and go home again. When you're looking after people in their own home, you've got a completely different dynamic. This is their domain and you're coming into their home to deliver necessary health care, but you have to work around the boundaries and, and the rules and, and the, um, the flexibility that they will allow. And that requires quite a lot of different skills in order to ensure that people still get safe and effective health care. So at this point, um, I was learning to lead. I was expected to be a team leader as soon as I'd finished this course. I was learning um, how to develop my skills in a different area of work. And I was learning um, how to use m my newly um, increased confidence in order to be able to do that effectively. So I worked as a district nursing sister um, for about six years. I had responsibility for the team. I had a caseload usually of around 400 patients. So quite a different um, environment than being in a ward area where you're um, beds are limited and once they're full they're full. Managing the team was um, another challenge sometimes. People who I worked with had often worked in that area for a significant number of years before I came along so I had to learn how to um, trust them but also feel that I could maybe put my own stamp on things as well. Managing the workload can be challenging in the community, well, in any area of practice, as you'll know. Um, you have to prioritise, you have to decide what absolutely must be done first, what could possibly be delayed till later, those sorts of things. Um, I, I um, started working on call for the first time in my career. And the challenge of working with GPs was an interesting dynamic because district nurses at that time were GP um, attached. And so you'd have um, a group of GPs. In my situation, there was two different practices and eight different GPs, all with their own personalities, all with their own ways of wanting to do things, all with their own th uh, things that they thought were important. Um, and not with a great deal of understanding about what nursing was about. So um, it was a challenge in that um, situation to make sure that the patients had the nursing care that they needed and the doctor then came in when they needed medical care. So at that point I was thinking, well, you know, I'm still feeling the need to develop myself further. And I 
decided to do some further academic study. The year in university had opened my eyes to something that I hadn't previously considered possible and I undertook a BSc Honours in Nursing Studies. I did this in my own time. I paid for it myself. I was still a mum, don't forget. Um, and um, the organisation I worked for very graciously allowed me one day study leave per written assignment that I had to do. So every module I did, I had a day off um, as private study um, paid for by the organisation. Because of the way I was doing it, because it was a very part-time approach to the whole thing, um, I, it took me three years to do, to do that um, extra bit of study. So it was added on top of the diploma that I'd already got, but it took me three years to do what other people might do in a year. But it just shows that it is possible. And what came out of that um, was... Again, increased confidence, increased um, knowledge, opportunities, thoughts about possibilities. And at that point, I applied for and was successful in moving to a different trust um, and gaining a role as a wound care clinical nurse specialist. And this is where I met your deputy chief nurse because she was also undertaking a similar role um, but in, a, in the hospital environment and I was working in the community environment. So this was a whole new ball game for me again. It was a fixed term contract, that first um, job that I took. So it was 12 month contract which might just disappear at the end of 12 months. But what actually happened during that year was that the um, possibility to do um, to look at what was needed in the community area at that time led to the need for a permanent position. Now it kind of sounds as though I might have engineered it that way, but I don't think I did. I think I just had this um, role to look at what was problematic in the community area, what was needed, how could we develop further, and the number of things that needed to be done just grew like topsy. So pressure damage was a big issue, pressure damage equipment was very scarce at the time. Um, one of my awful jobs that I had to do was to, tr to look at a number of patients every week and decide which one of them was going to get the one dynamic mattress that was available at the time and things like that. So it was actually quite challenging. There was a move towards developing leg ulcer clinics. It was a national, um, nationally driven project from, from the London area initially, but now has become sort of standard practice in many areas of the country but we were one of the pioneering areas at that time. The other thing that became apparent was that um, nurses in the community spend an awful lot of time doing wound care um, in people's home or delivering wound care. Um, and um, there is a lot of patients who have chronic wounds that need to be visited on a regular basis. What they didn't have at that time was much support. So there was an awful lot of um, random practice going on. So uh, people were making up their own minds as to what treatments were appropriate, what dressings to use, how often to visit somebody, how many times a week something might need to be changed. Um, and so there was a huge amount of work there that, that involved trying to standardise that practice so that there wasn't a, a variation between teams as to what their patients might um, receive. The other thing that was a massive opportunity at the time was because Claire and myself had started our roles at a, a, a similar time, almost within a week or two of mm -hmm. each other, um, we were able to work very closely together to try and develop this seamless process between hospital um, and community. And I think we did that very successfully over our years together, didn't we, Claire? Um, and very proud of that. And then the other thing that I had to do 
was learn to teach. Because one of the things that I learned early on as a clinical nurse specialist was there's no point in one person having all the expertise. If you're really going to be an effective clinical nurse specialist, you need to be prepared to share that knowledge with as many people as possible so that they can go out and deliver the best possible health care um, to, to the patients. So um, one of the things that was um, something that was quite a challenge was to learn how to do what I'm doing today, stand up in, a group, in front of a group of, of people and um, try and impart something to them. I was lucky in that my uh, manager at the time was the clinical education manager for the organisation, so she was very um, in favour of, of that, um, that skill being developed. Um, and as such, I was supported to do some further academic study. So at this point, I'd already got a BSc, I moved into a master's programme. Started off doing a postgraduate certificate in health and social care education. Furthered that on to a master's degree in nursing and education, um, and also undertook a postgraduate diploma in tissue viability at a different university to my local one. Um, and at the same time, nurse prescribing was being um, introduced as a, um, a new thing for district nurses um, and health visitors in the community. <coughs> that, again, as you will know, has developed further um, and, and a much wider range of, of nurses, allied health professionals, pharmacists, etc., are now able to prescribe. And then the other thing that happened as a result of that was that led to me um, being asked to develop some modules at the University of Brighton where I was locally based um, and uh, develop those modules in wound care, leg ulcer care um, and act as a visiting lecturer to some of the student nurse courses etc. What then happened was that the community trust grew. So one organisation that was quite a small geographical area um, joined forces with a, uh, with a neighbouring trust, which happens all the time in the NHS, doesn't it? You know, people marry and divorce all the time, these organisations. And suddenly we had become a much larger area. So at that point, I was working um, as a nurse consultant, managing a team of clinical nurse specialists over quite a large geographical area. Um, so there was a lot of new skills again, service management, multidisciplinary working, developing policies, making sure that policies in different areas um, were unified, looking at standards and statistics, meeting targets, managing budgets, um, and more importantly than anything else, and this has always been an important aspect of, of what I think is um, my, my sort of place in life, if you like, in the workplace, is to support other nurses to develop their knowledge and skills and confidence so that they can go out and do the things that they um, have to do in the best possible way. That role continued. I was in that role altogether for about 18 years. Um, and I decided that I needed to do something different with my life. My children were grown up and had left at that point. Um, I was no longer married at that point. And so I left the NHS after a lot of years in that protected environment, if you like, um, and decided to go travelling for a little while and then I set up um, as an independent um, business. Just me, nobody else, I'm not, um, I'm not employing anybody. So this is what I do now um, and if any of this is of any value to you then please feel free to ask me questions about any of these things. I still provide lectures at the University of Brighton and some other places as asked. I have had some private patients, which is an interesting thing entirely because um, the people who can usually do that are people with lots of money 
and that is a whole new dynamic visiting people who, who live a lifestyle that maybe you've never even considered or thought of yourself. Um, I provide academic support to people when they're going through their um, uh, learning processes if asked. Um, I undertake audit and project work um, as required um, if I'm commissioned to do so. But the things I spend the most of my time doing is I'm a registrant panel member at the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Now, I don't actually work for the Nursing and Midwifery Council. We're all independent. Um, but um, I sit on fitness to practice panels in the com uh, competence and, and competency um, that's not right. I've just thought, I've said that, but it's not quite right. I, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, but anyway, people who, uh, the conduct and competency um, committees, that's what I'm talking about. So these are nurses who have fallen foul, really, of the, the code and, and maybe their standards haven't met the standards that uh, is expected of them. Now, I have to say, out of all the nurses that there are, it's very small percentage that end up being referred to the Nursing Midwifery Council. So there is a bit of perspective there. So there's almost 700,000 registered nurses in the UK. That includes Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And less than 1% of those people will be referred to the Nursing and Midwifery Council. So we're not talking about huge numbers. But what we are talking about is people that have... Um, maybe lost their perspective on what nursing is about, maybe forgotten that about safety, maybe forgotten about checking, things like um, medicines administration errors because they've become too laissez-faire about it possibly, um, things to do with honesty and integrity, things that really matter to the values of nursing um, and those are the people that are likely to be in difficulties and, and maybe um, come before a disciplinary hearing. I'm also appointed as a lay member, uh, lay panel member to the Pharmaceutical Society of, Society of Ireland, so that's the Republic of Ireland. I've yet to sit on one of their um, hearings so that's a new role that I'm hoping will develop um, in the near future. And the other thing I do is I act as expert witness for um, litigation. So this might be uh, liability claims, either for the defendant or the, um, the, the claimant. These are usually things relating to tissue viability, very frequently things to do with pressure damage, very frequently the d difficulty that arises is that pressure damage has um, developed in a care setting and the record keeping doesn't show what actually happened clearly. So um, there is a question mark over whether the person actually received the care that they should have received. The other thing that I do as part of that work is that if somebody has been awarded um, uh, through the court that they should receive um, some compensation, then I do an assessment of that individual in relation to my areas of expertise um, and price that up in terms of what equipment, what care might be required. And that could be as a result of a litigation um, from, for negligence, but it also, um, and, and more commonly, is as a result of um, traumatic events. So, for example, road traffic accidents that result in somebody being catastrophically injured um, from that process. So it's a, an insurance issue. So, all, through all of that, um, hopefully I've, I've learnt to lead, hopefully I've learnt to encourage and develop others. Um, so my feeling is that leadership is the process of professional and social influence, but that's so that you can enlist and support others to accomplish whatever the common goal is. So it's about supporting and um, enthusing other people.
Novice to expert, question mark. I feel that in nearly 40 years as a registered nurse, never a day goes by that I don't learn something new that will help me do my job better. And I think that is my closing message to you as healthcare providers. There is always something you can learn. There is always something new you can develop. There are always opportunities that will open up. There is always ways of providing better, more effective care to our patients. Thank you. I do. And she's so modest, so she's an international expert on leg ulcers, she forgot to mention that. Um, when her and I were looking at a specialist, we met Heather Newton, so I did say to Heather that Terry's going, the teach biology team, we worked together up there, um, so we met Heather then. Um, so are you okay to answer a few questions? Yes, I'm happy to answer questions, yes, please. Oh, Got any questions? What's been your favourite job? What's, what do you think has been your favourite part of nursing? Um... That's an interesting one. I'll be honest with you, probably doing the fitness to practice thing. Um, partly because, and, and I do that as a registered nurse. If, if um, any of you have ever been involved in a fitness to practice process, either, you know, on the falling foul side or, or as, um, you know, acting as a, a witness or whatever, one of the things I feel very privileged with in that role is that, yes, I sometimes have to make tough decisions about that particular practitioner, but also I have the opportunity to influence my lay colleagues about what might have been the circumstances that led to that particular situation arising. Um, and so I find that quite a, a satisfying process because sometimes people come before the regulator because they haven't been adequately supported in the workplace. That is unlikely to happen for you folk working in a big organisation like this. But lots of people in nursing don't work for big organisations. They work for small individual nursing homes, for example, GP practices, those sorts of areas. Um, and they don't have the support and HR facilities that, that you are um, able to have here. So yes, I think that's probably my most satisfying is to be able to be clear about when somebody needs some support, when they might be able to be, um, you know, sort of continue as a safe and effective nurse, even if they need some additional support to do that. But also, if they're somebody that you wouldn't let near your granny, then do we actually want them to be on the register at all? So I, that's, that's my answer, I think. Anything else? What do you think has been your biggest challenge throughout your career so far? Politics in the NHS, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, trying to um, balance the needs of the, um, the government, if you like, you know, sort of targets and all that sort of thing against um, being able to provide safe and effective healthcare so it is actually quite challenging sometimes when your heart is going this way but the you know the the, the uh, powers that be if you like are saying no we've got to go this way that's that's challenging I think. Do you want to do you mind telling people about how you felt when you were going to leave the NHS and were going to set up on your own? Do you mind telling people how they could... So, some, so I invited some CNSs because I was thinking they might uh, want to do this. Um, they might want to. So what were the things you were thinking about? I, I was scared, to be honest. I'd always worked for the NHS for, for mm -hmm. years. And I mean, I, I was used to a paycheck coming in every month. I was used to having that protected environment. Um, and I didn't know if there was any work out there, to be honest. I didn't know where it was going to go. But I knew that I had to stop doing what I was doing at that point because I had got to a point where I was um, overwhelmed, if you like, by the politics. Um, I felt that it was time for me to go off and do something different. Um, and one of the things that has been really positive is finding that there is work out there. 
Um, there is probably much more than I take because I choose not to work all the time. I've got grandchildren now and I like to spend time with them so it's managing again the work-life balance. I don't advertise myself, I'm not, I don't have a website but the phone rings or somebody sends a message or something happens um, and I'm able to get work that way. And some of that work has been quite challenging. The expert witness work has been a massive learning curve. When I first started doing it, I hated it, absolutely hated it, and thought, oh, I need to get some other work so I can give this one up. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and now I've got to the stage where I've been doing it for about four years, um, got much, much better at it, don't worry about it nearly as much as I used to, feel much more um, as though I'm delivering what's necessary in order to ease the legal side of things because that's a, you know, that's a whole new um, area th uh, that I hadn't even considered before. I've learnt so much about the law with both that role and the NMC role. Um, and, and being able to actually gain the confidence um, and get to a point where I get um, positive strokes from various people that use my services. So that's really nice. I Thank think that's... Thank you. Any other questions? Have you found it difficult sometimes in some of your law work or the expert witness stuff where you've not necessarily agreed? Oh, yes. Oh yes. And she's not a girl who holds her tongue no, for no, a long time. No, I mean I've, I've had, uh, early on I had to have a conversation with a solicitor and say I can't do this report if you want me to say what I think you want me to say because I don't believe that's what happened. And um, you know obviously the solicitors have a completely different objective to myself so my, my objective is to be as transparent as possible, objective as possible, look at the facts and make some sort of determination from those facts about what happened and when it happened and what effect that might have had for the individual. That's why record keeping is so vital because that's the story that helps through this process. But um, yeah, there have been situations where I've been um, instructed by a claimant solicitor and I thought, no, there's no, there's no case here. I don't think there's a case. But then I do that. I put that in my report. I don't say it quite like that, of course. I, I lay out the facts and determine from those facts. You have to use a legal test. So you actually have to say whether something is more likely than not to have happened and whether that falls below the standard of, um, you know, the everyday ordinary nurse, but in a nutshell. Um, so, but yes, it's, it's a skill to learn that. Um, and it's also a skill to be able to um, maintain your objectivity, particularly if somebody's putting you under pressure to say something different. Thank you very much. I think um, Kim is just going to uh, thank Terry. Oh, I couldn't get out of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds okay. like people have that <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing. You're welcome. I think there's two things that stand out to me. Terry's kindly shared her journey, her role for the last 40 years. So truly novice to expert, but most importantly, you never know everything. And, and that's always important. The second thing is, if you haven't read the code, please do yourself a favour, read, read the code, it's really important, and we can always circulate the link after this. And thirdly, I say it, I think, very regularly, documentation. Mm -hmm. If anything is going to tell your story, and you never know when your story might need to be heard, it's your documentation that will be that. Yeah, definitely. You might think what happens today or an event is the worst thing that can ever happen. And probably on that day it is. But by the time things sometimes go to court or to the NMC, you can be three or four years mm. down the line. And lots of not so great things might have happened. And all you're left with is the records mm. because your memory has moved on by then. So thank you very, very much, Terry. It was really, really interested. interesting. If anyone thinks of their story on Nurses and Midwifery Day this year, we'd like to share stories of past, present and future. So if you'd like to share your story, please let us know and we can build that in.
So so there's going to be yeah. an, um, an, an event in the chapel. So it's going to be all day, and it'll be all day, various people doing stories or reading poems or talking about nurses from fiction or, sh or showing pictures, whatever you want. So that is going to be the programme. We're going to have some key people in. So Kim will be talking about her role, Kate will, Sue Bracefield will, um, and then we will be definitely talking about nursing and fiction because it's an absolute passion of mine. So we'll be talking about that um, and various things all day. So that's on the, t on the 12th of May. Also, we'll be lighting the buildings blue for year of mid and people not in uniform will be encouraged to wear blue. So there'll be all sorts of things happening. We'll have a programme event every mm -hmm. month and we'll be advertising it very soon. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much. And Claire, thank you for your organisation. Thank you.